right now. And so thank you for joining us, Danny. Um, this is, well, first let me introduce myself. I'm Trish Triampho Sullivan from Downtown Book and Sound. And we're here tonight with our guest, Danny Kane of the Raven Bookstore in Lawrence, Kansas. Hopefully I pronounced it right. <laughs> <laughs> Danny's the author of How to Resist Amazon and Why. And we're really happy to have him here because this has been um, a book that I really enjoyed. And I not only read it, but I listened to it. And, uh, and, it's, and it's read by, by Danny Kane himself. So it was a, it was a real good, uh, a, a really good read. Uh, Thank you. And so welcome, Danny. Uh, this is Danny Kane, as you can see from the screen. <laughs> and he's joining us today from, I'm guessing, from from uh, from your bookstore or from home? Oh, no, this is my apartment. Your apartment. Yeah, okay, so spent, you're, you're at home. Um, yeah, I so spent all day in my bookstore because we opened to the public for the first time uh, today. It was 444 days we were closed. Um, because of the pandemic, and we were—I mean, we were doing online shipping, and it was us. Uh, we had books, a full team of booksellers in there, but this is the first time browsers were in the store. So I was at the store for like ten hours, and I decided to come home where it's nice <laughs> and comfy for a change of scenery. But I'm happy to be here. Well, thank you, and I'm, I'm very glad that you. And congratulations on being open after such a long time closed. Yeah. Um, that's really rough, and it's rough in retail. Even if you're doing shipping and curbside pickup and stuff, it's yeah. still uh, it, it's still a real rough, uh, <laughs> yeah, a, a rough year and uh, and change there. So, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm so glad, and, and I'm glad it was a busy day for you. Thank you. That's great. So let's start off. I'd, I'd like to ask you a little bit about yourself, uh, where you're from originally, um, and uh, sure. what brought you to uh, to Lawrence, Kansas. Yeah, I, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and lived there my whole life. Uh, went to went to college for teaching and taught uh, high school English for a few years. Um, that didn't end up being my thing quite so much. So I um, went to grad school to figure out what the heck I was going to do. Ended up kind of falling in love with writing poetry so much that I applied for MFAs in poetry and got into the University of Kansas um, and got a good offer from them. So I decided uh, to move to Lawrence. And as I moved to Lawrence, um, I had never lived in a city that had a great uh, independent bookstore like the Raven or like downtown books and sound. Um, and I just fell in love with the Raven and, and became a customer and eventually um, began a, a prolonged campaign of trying to get a job, which took many months and finally started working there uh, part time throughout grad school. And when I graduated, the owner started talking about retiring. And I was like, hey, this might be my dream job. I really want to take a chance at this. So we worked things out. Uh, and I bought the store in August 2017, almost four years ago. And, and here we are. I live in Kansas. I never thought I would, but I love it here. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, th how, so how long did you work there before you, uh, before you bought the store? About two and a half years. And, and throughout, um, I, I learned more and more about the business and, and made friends with my coworkers and other booksellers and, and tried to just do as much as I could with events or ordering or marketing or social media and just you know kept getting more and more involved and falling more in love with it. Um, so it seemed like a no brainer. And The Raven was open, it started in September, 1987. So it, like this was a business that had a, a long-term built-in beloved community and a community that supported it and loved it. And so like, if I was ever gonna get a chance to run a bookstore, this is it because I had a running head start, I had a three decade <laughs> head start of people who love this place. And all I had to do really was not screw it up. And that's still kind of how I think of it. Uh, is I'm doing what the, the my predecessors did and just trying to honor their legacy. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and did, so tell, tell us me a little about, tell us a little bit about your poetry as well, because that's something that I haven't, I haven't read any of your poetry. Uh -huh. Well, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think all, I, I forgot who said it, but I heard a writer say once that all, every writer has, has a very, very small number of obsessions. And, and I think my obsession is um, what people do to, to exist and form identities in a corporate capitalist world. Um, in this kind of um, late capitalism, corporation-dominated society, how do people fall in love or form their identities or eat 
uh, or form families? And I, I think that's kind of the question that the Amazon book answers. And that's a question I'm trying to get at with my poetry. So the poetry, um, I have three collections out. It's, it's kind of a trilogy. Um, the first is Continental Breakfast. The second is El Dorado Freddy's. And the third is Flavortown, which just came out. And it's kind of like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And it's exploring all those issues through, uh, through food. Um, parenting comes up. I had a son three years ago in the middle of writing this trilogy. Um, so I, I'm concerned with all this stuff, but it's like, what, what do you do? America is controlled by giant companies and for economic forces beyond our control. And like, how do you try to be human and all of that? And I think that's the best way I can link the Amazon book and, and work with the, the poetry. People also tell me it's funny. Uh, so like, I'm not always trying to write funny poetry, but uh, I, I have heard from reputable sources that from time to time it happens. So you have, there's some humor in there. Now, are, yeah. your, are your poetry books available from Ingram? So that's something yep. we can order in our bookstore? Uh-huh. Well, that's that's awesome because actually poetry is really popular in our community and a lot of okay. young people, a lot of young people are reading poetry. Um, and it's one of our best, besides the manga, um, uh -huh. <laughs> um, it's one of our best sellers or, or poetry. Good. So I'm glad I'm, to hear it. I'm going to bring yours in. I'm excited. Thanks. So hopefully it's it. It's an amazing time for poetry. It's there's so much good poetry happening. It's easier than ever to find an entry into into poetry. And there are so many dynamic and amazing. I'm not even talking about myself. There are so many dynamic and interesting uh, and, and amazing poets. And it's such a broad world. If you uh, think you don't like poetry, you probably just haven't found the right poet or poetry book yet. And, and that's why we have good independent booksellers to help you with that. Yeah, actually, I I agree with you there. If if you haven't if you if, if someone hasn't really found the right poet then that's the only reason they don't like poetry because mm -hmm. really poetry is spoken music yeah. so anyone who loves music um really you know i can't imagine they wouldn't love poetry if they if they yeah. tried it a right. bit. well and especially if the last time you tried it was in high school and you were reading like shakespeare sonnet sonnets and there's nothing against a good shakespeare sonnet i love it but uh, there's there's so much more out there than what you you know what Mr. Smith taught you in tenth grade. Well, that's true, and and I I I'd say that um, like for me one of one of my most ex things that I still remember about poetry was was the challenge of of committing to memory a poem in in high school English class. They made us memorize and then do a dramatic reading right mm -hmm. of a, of a particular poem. And so I chose the Raven, which is Ooh. appropriate. Uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, and, and of course, you know, I still know it by heart. So, and, you know, I can recite it at the drop of a hat. Well, I'm not going to do it now. Okay. <laughs> You'll thank me. <laughs> Where's the proof, Trish? <laughs> <laughs> Where's the proof? Never more. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, um, we used to, we had so much fun with it when I was practicing. Um, my mom would be in the background knocking on, on something every time. <laughs> Sound oh, that's great. So, yeah, uh, that's a, a little, too, little too much information maybe, but I love uh, it. Uh, so, uh, so let's, let's get to the meat of this. Let's start talking about some of, about the Amazon, um, mm -hmm. how to resist. Um, and you're right. You talked about how the our country is pretty much controlled by giant corporations, um, and but your book is very optimistic um, mm -hmm. about how we can do things to you know to uh, uh, to really support local and be more of community minded. Uh, and I like that's one of the things I liked about your book is that it is optimistic. Um, what what was the first thing that really got you uh, got you researching this, and 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 how did you really get into it? Well, it's a good question, and I think it goes back to those original owners of the Raven. Um, they uh, for the the store opened in 1987, and then in 1997, ten years in, directly across the street. Um, after a, a really contentious and drawn out bidding and, and developing process, a Borders Books and Music opened a superstore, a chain book superstore, uh, like 200 feet from the Raven's front door. Um, you could see it from the cash register. And so the, the owners, um, Pat Katie and Mary Lou Wright were their names. They were faced with the choice of what do you do? 
Um, and they, they, they decided to um, tell their story as much as they could and everywhere and, and be very loud and outspoken about the importance of small businesses and independent bookstores and op-eds and, and letters to politicians in newspaper interviews. They would have been on Twitter had that been an option um, at, at the time. Uh, and then also just get really good at being a bookstore and, and double down on, on the service and, and the charm and everything that makes a bookstore great. Um, and then, of course, Borders, it shut down when the whole chain shut down in 2011. But by that point, Amazon was a much bigger threat. Um, and so I just kind of took inspiration from them. And it's, it's built into what we do. And it has been for decades uh, that the, the way to kind of survive or thrive as a bookstore is to tell our story and convince people of our importance and be really good at what we do. So I just, I kind of took that from them and it's, it's adapted to the times. I talk much more about Amazon than I do about chain bookstores because I think it's a much bigger threat. And I, I use Twitter, I, I use zines, I use um, e tools that are available to me and fit my style of, of, of writing and thinking. Um, so I'm just doing what, and it's, it's hard to say when it starts because to run a bookstore, you have to think about Amazon. You have to have an answer to this. You have to have some sort of strategy to deal with the fact that people can find these books so much cheaper online. Um, it's it's just, and, and I hate that. I really don't like that that's part of what we do. I should be able to do this out of the love of books and, and not have to kind of wily coyote my way around this giant um, elephant in the room. Uh, but it's part of the thing. And it's it was there as soon as I started working. And then, in terms of the book, um, you know, I, I one of the goals, one of the things I did when I took over the Raven was kind of unify our Twitter voice and um, and and get uh, get better at, at tweeting and social media. And that, of course, talked about involved talking about um, Amazon and a couple tweets got some attention. Um, I wrote an open letter to Jeff Bezos, so that was probably the germ of it. Once we started getting attention for this, I was like, I need a thesis statement. I need to write down, I need to make my case. I need to have, then this is the former English teacher in me. It's like, I need to have a thesis, right? Uh, and then a friend of mine who works at Maxbex in Cleveland, Ohio, told me that I should turn the letter into a broadside or a zine that she could sell. And I really liked that idea because it turned the conversation of Amazon from a bookseller conversation to something that happened across the cash register between booksellers and customers. And that struck me as really important. Um, and so that's kind of how the zine was was born. But so it's a long answer, but there was no single moment. You know, it was it, uh, it it's it's baked in. It's it's been part of what my book selling philosophy from day one. So I, I have a question for you. As, as you mm -hmm. you talked about um, Barnes and Noble um, being or uh, was it Barnes and Noble or um, Borders? It was Borders. I'm yeah. sorry, Borders. You talked about Borders being across the street, um, uh, opening up a superstore. Now, do you feel, as I do, I'm just as my opinion, that Amazon really had a lot to do with uh, with bar with uh, Borders um, going like like mm -hmm. going out of business? Oh yeah, uh, and I think it's it's hard hit. Small bookstores are with Amazon. They're the chains are even harder hit. Um, their, their overhead is much higher, their buildings, their costs are much higher. They need to do a lot more volume, uh, to, um, to break even. Um, and, and they're, they're much more directly competing with Amazon in a way. Cause the idea when you walk into a Barnes and Noble is kind of that, like they have every book in stock and I'll probably be able to get it on sale. Um, I would never promise to have every book in stock. You walk into the Raven or you walk into downtown books and you know, this is a curated, selection. This is small. Um, this 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 bookstore kind of represents a point of view or a specialty. But Barnes & Noble is, is kind of like an everything store, which is famously Amazon, one of Amazon's original slogans. So I think the big chains are hit much harder. But another benefit of a small business in terms of this is like there are 12 of us at the Raven, uh, there, me and 11 employees, and we can have a meeting and change our approach in hours. Um, we can pivot on a dime and we can get be really nimble um, and and we can kind of be feisty if we want or funny. And it's it's just up to us. We only answer to us and our community. And so there's not a big kind of clunky corporate bureaucracy that we have to navigate through. And I think that um, that nimbleness, especially with something like the coronavirus pandemic has, has really helped us. Um, we're not as big or as strong, but we might be kind of faster and we're certainly more clever. <laughs> well, that's a great answer because uh, I, I believe that uh, 
that we do have a lot of, uh, well, a, a, a kind of an edge, I guess, as an independent bookseller or an independent retailer in, in general because of that. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the things that, that we have over any kind of big box store is we do have the customer service that's really yeah. personable. Whereas you go to a box store of any kind, whether it's a bookseller or anything else. And it, for most of those people, it's just a job. They really don't care about the customers or about the merchandise or whatever it is. They're just there to, to make a buck. And that's, that's pretty much it. So, um, so I, I feel you're right. We're, we're much more nimble. You, you know, you can have a, 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 a team meeting and totally, uh, change your whole, your, your, your whole, uh, attitude of your store if you want to, and just in, you know, in a day. So yeah. that's, that's good. I like that. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. That said, it's like, I, I am kind of rooting for Barnes and Noble just because I, I fear, um, that like I, I I don't think I wonder if Barnes and Noble goes away or the big bookstore chain goes away. I'm not sure that business goes to indie bookstores. I, I just fear it would make Amazon even more powerful. And I think um, at this point, anybody who's selling books in a brick and mortar building is kind of in the same boat. It's all of us versus Amazon. It's and it makes <laughs> unlikely bedfellows, especially when you think about the um, there were there were prolonged legal battles in the 90s between the, the American Booksellers Association and the big chains. Um, but like we need all the leverage we can get in terms of publishing for, for the people who are selling books in real life, not online. Um, so uh, I, I, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'm not rooting for the downfall of Barnes and Noble. I'm curious to see what happens with uh, their new CEO and, and, and what's going on. And I'm watching it kind of closely. Well, I, I actually agree with you on that. I, I, I think that uh, large stores actually benefit us. Um, it's kind of the more the merrier for brick and mortar. Yeah. Um, one of the things I noticed, though, recently was that, uh, and may, when I say recently, I'm talking maybe a year and a half or two years ago, was that Amazon was opening up corner books. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of thought to myself, okay, so here Amazon comes out. And, um, you know, first we have all these, these kind of big box bookstores like, like uh, uh, Borders and, and Barnes and & Noble, which is really large. And then um, uh, Amazon comes along and they all, not they don't all go out of business, but they're greatly reduced um, in capacity. Uh, and and as, these, as these big box bookstores come out, uh, a lot of the small in indie stores actually did go under. Not all of them, obviously, there's still a lot left. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them did were to kind of succumb to the to the big box store thing um, phenomena. And, uh, and then so it, and then there's not much left. And Amazon decides to open up a corner bookstore. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, okay, so they know that people that that as consumers, uh, consumers tend to spend more money in a brick and mortar store mm. than they do online. So Amazon's trying to get the best of both worlds here, I guess. I mean, it's just well, really it's, it's a classic monopoly move. It's kind of the definition of predatory pricing is you lower your prices to the point that it's putting your competition out of business. Then you raise prices and kind of take over the marketplace that you, so, um, I don't think it's a surprise that they're they're going for for the brick and mortar. That said, have you ever been in one? Have you gone to an Amazon bookstore? I haven't had an opportunity to. It's yet. so weird. It's a it's it feels like a bookstore that's run by people who don't understand bookstores. It, like all of the books are face outs, um, so it's oh. uh, um, it doesn't have that that delightfully full look like the shelf behind you. Like that's that's a really inviting bookshelf. It's full of goodies. Um, but You're there's uh, to take a quick look at yeah, the right. sci-fi paperback section that I'm sitting in right now. <laughs> it looks great. It, it it looks full and abundant, but the the Amazon it feels clinical. And then it's like instead of like new releases or um or like sci-fi books by writers of color, their tables are like these books all have 4.8 stars or higher on Amazon. And so like they don't make sense. It's just the most random assortment of of books. And they tried to organize uh, a bookstore like a website, and it feels like a bookstore in an alternate universe. It's a very strange experience, and so I'm not that worried about the Amazon physical stores because they're not that good. 
Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah. I'm really happy to hear that. I, I'm not. I wasn't really worried about them because, because frankly, um, I know that my I and my staff can provide the most exceptional customer service possible yeah. in our community, um, and any I, we can out we can out. Uh, oh, what's the right word? I want to know. It's not outsell really, but but just uh, out. We can we can provide that that comfortable feeling and that welcoming feeling that that other stores just can't do. Yeah, right. And of course, online can certainly can't do it. <laughs> right. I mean, I do. I really believe you know shopping and and going into a store. Um, it's an emotional experience and it's a social experience and. Um, you know, humans as social animals, we want to go and see other people mm -hmm. and, and have relationships with them, um, whether it's in, in a bookstore or a grocery store, or whatever. I'm not satisfied to buy everything online ever. I've never, I mean, do I shop online? Yeah, once in a while. Do I shop on Amazon? No. <laughs> I, I try to buy as much as I can locally. There's, there's yeah. occasions when it's, things just aren't available and you got to go somewhere else. But, um, I've, I've made it a point. I, I, a couple of years ago, I, I canceled my prime membership. I, I, gosh, I'm sorry. Did I say that? I used to <laughs> <laughs> it was before you read the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was, it was before I read the book. So, I mean, I was already on that kind of a page mm -hmm. of, 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 Hey, we got to, we got to yeah. cir yeah. circle our wagons and, uh, and, and not really fight back, but, but just be better. Mm -hmm. Well, and well, here's, here's where the, the optimism, optimism in the book comes in. The book comes um, in. So the, uh, I'm not sure Amazon feels a canceled sub prime subscription. I'm not sure anyone in Amazon is like, Oh, that's bad for our bottom line. It's like, Oh no, what a bad day. We lost a customer. Like they're too big and they have too many revenue streams for it to really make a dent. And so, that's kind of why I, I am a little hesitant to frame this totally in terms of consumer choice, especially like there's more we can do uh, to kind of prevent Amazon's explosive growth than just to everybody boycott. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But I think that the, the way I try to turn this into an optimistic um, argument is that if Amazon doesn't feel you cancel your Prime subscription, the small businesses in your town will feel your new support. And the, the bookstore will notice you buying books from them. And the organic food co-op will notice the new owner. And all of these businesses um, are, are small enough and local enough that they can really feel your impact locally. Uh, and so it is a positive thing. It's not just resisting Amazon. It's supporting and investing in your own community and, and the, small, the small businesses in your community and the community-oriented people that are doing work uh, to make sure your community is a nice place to be. So that's why I think at heart, this is an optimistic argument. Um, and if, if you wanna cancel your prime as a matter of individual choice, that's great. I certainly don't like to support businesses that, that have values that are so far from my own, uh, which is why I don't support Amazon. But um, I, I think it's just as much about adding your support um, to the small places in your community. Well, that that's a really good way to put it, and it is optimistic. Um, I, I I've always believed, and for many many years, that uh, when you shop local, your dollar circulates in your community um, much more. And and I know there's there's actual statistics, and it mm -hmm. probably is like eighty seven cents of every dollar you know goes in your community, and um, and if you buy something online, it's like I don't know twelve cents. It's something you know it's not very much. Um, so, I mean, just from a strictly economic and, and, and community minded kind of thing, I mean, we're really, we're doing more in our community if we, if, if we uh, shop locally and that's, mm -hmm. that's just, plus you're, you're, you know, building some nice social uh, uh, whatever uh, circles with you. With yeah. Your, it's well. fun. It's fun to go to a bookstore. <laughs> like, you, you get to know people and, and uh, it's just an enjoyable thing. I think it's much more pleasurable. Uh, it, it's, it's perhaps not as convenient or as cheap, but I think it, you more than make up for that in, in the atmosphere and the act and the joyful experience of, of being surrounded by books and bookish people for, for a few minutes. 
It, it's true. I mean, we do have, we've only been open for two years. So unlike your store that uh, has been, you know, around for quite some time, um, you know, we, we opened, we had a very, very small used bookstore in a smaller space and expanded two years ago into a new and used bookstore in a, a space of about 2,500 square feet. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been a, a, a it, and it's been quite a journey, uh, Never in my wildest dreams would I have thought that I'd be owning a bookstore. <laughs> Put it that way. It wasn't. It wasn't. You know, I, I'm also a, a teacher. I teach art at uh, the local community college, photography and and painting and art history, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, of course, I love reading. And and uh, um, that to me, that was something that was uh, <clears throat> was. I've always loved bookstores. I've spent probably a lot of money in bookstores over yeah. my lifetime. I won't, I won't say how much, but um, <laughs> I probably could have bought a couple of bookstores with the amount of money I've spent on books over the years. So, um, so, 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 opening this bookstore was was quite the adventure and a real and and in a way there was a little bit of sadness to it as well because um, because our bookstore really was made possible by the closure of. Uh, the retirement of another bookseller in the area um, that had been around for, I think, like 45 years was Logos Books and Music in Santa Cruz, California, which is just a, about 45 minutes from us. And we we ended up buying all their shelves and all their stock that they had left when they closed, when the owner retired. Um, and so there was a little sadness, but now his store lives on in our store, which yeah. is kind of cool. So we've We've upcycled all that stuff that might have <laughs> might have gone by the wayside, on you know, and 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 being able to to hang on to it. Um, so, what um, what else would you like to add about about your about your book? And um, and also, would would you would you like to do a little short, you know, reading from it today sure. for us? Yeah. yeah. I can, I can read that. Read that um, um, I'm getting a little getting bit of an echo. echo. Oops. I wonder if Let it's, me it's... hang on a sec. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, I I think I I might just read the um, this letter to Jeff Bezos, um, which is it's it's about five minutes, um, but it's I think it does do a good job, and I wrote it to kind of summarize my argument. Um, so if it's okay with you, I might just read the letter because I think it's a really great introduction to the book. It happens first. Okay. Um, a letter to Jeff Bezos from a small bookstore in the middle of the country. Uh, dear Jeff, last Wednesday, a customer bought a stack of books from us. Right before he left, he asked me what parts of your business are affected by Amazon. I blurted out every part. I had never articulated this before, but it's true. I know I'm not alone in saying this, and not just among bookstores either, yet your your business has an unfair impact on every retail small business in America. I'm writing to you to try to illustrate just how many people your business affects in a negative way. Let's start with books, because that's where we overlap, and books are my bread and butter. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it certainly seems like the book part of your business is modeled like this. Sell books at a loss to hook people into Prime subscriptions, Kindles, Alexas, and other higher margin products. While this strategy has worked really well for you, it's totally disrupted everything about the book business, making a low margins business even tighter. Most dismayingly to us, your book business has devalued the book itself. People expect new hardcovers to be 15 bucks and new paperbacks to be under 10. Those margins are a nightmare for our bottom line, of course, but they also cheapen the idea of the capital B book. There's already enough happening to to cheapen the idea of truth, research, and careful storytelling. We're dismayed to see the world's biggest book retailer reflecting that frightening cultural shift by devaluing books. This isn't just about business competition to us. We wish it were. We like business competition. We think it's healthy. But the way you've set things up makes it impossible to compete with you. Often the tech and e-commerce world brags about disrupting old ways of doing things with new, sleeker, more efficient tricks. But we refuse to be a quaint old way of doing things and we are not ripe for disruption. We're not relics, we're community engines. We create free programming. We donate gift certificates to charity silent auctions. We partner with libraries and arts organizations. 
that stuff might seem small to someone aiming to colonize outer space, but to us and our community, it's huge. Our booksellers are farmers, authors, activists, artists, board members, city council representatives. For so many places, the loss of an indie bookstore would mean the loss of a community force. If your retail experiment disrupts us into extinction, you're not threatening quaint old ways of doing things. You're threatening communities. When I taught high school English, we did a business letter unit. Part of what I taught was to make sure every business letter has some kind of request so it's not a waste of time or paper. So what's a request from you? Some of my peers want to break your company up. Some of them want to nationalize it. Some of them want it wiped off the earth. I see where they're all coming from, but I don't think that's what I'm after today. Actually, since writing this, I've come around on the breaking Amazon up thing, and I think it's totally necessary, but that's uh, a digression. <laughs> Uh, I could also request you stop profiting off of ISIS violence, stop enabling counterfeit merchandise, stop fostering a last mile shipping system that causes injury and death, stop gentrifying our cities, stop contributing to the police state with your doorbell cameras, stop driving your warehouse workers to exhaustion or injury, or so many other things. Perhaps I could just request an explanation of why this chaos and violence is apparently so essential to your strategy. Or maybe I could request a leveling of the playing field. Small business owners are led to believe that if their idea is good enough, they can grow their business and create more jobs. Yet your company is so big, so disruptive, so dominant, that it severely skewed the ability for us to do that. I think a big part of leveling the playing field would mean fair pricing on your part. For our part, we try to level things by being really good at what we do and really loud. So we use our platform to try to teach people what's at stake as your company increases its influence and market share. I think it's starting to work. I get the feeling that we're seeing chips in Amazon's armor. Whenever we share stuff like this, it seems to resonate with our audience. Maybe someday you'll hear what we have to say. Maybe we can talk about it over pie and coffee at Ladybird Diner across the street, my treat. I'd love to show you around a vibrant community anchored by small businesses here in Kansas, here on earth. Maybe it'll help you realize that some things don't need to be disrupted. Sincerely, Danny Kane, owner, Raven Bookstore, Lawrence, Kansas. Thanks. <laughs> I hear ghostly applause from someone I can't see. <laughs> oh, hang on a sec. Let me, uh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Now, now you can see me again. <laughs> I was hiding while I was typing in about the book plates and stuff. So, okay. um, so that, that was really good. So I, I just want to jump in and say the book plates that Trish designed are super cool and they're <laughs> exclusive to downtown books and sound. Um, so you can't get these anywhere else. Uh, I can't wait to see them and sign them and send them back, but this is a, a an exclusive. Oops, they kind of look like this. That's the, the black and white version. Um, but, uh, we will, we, this as a quick heads up, I don't want to take away from what you just read because I'd like to discuss that for a second, but as long as we're on the subject quickly, um, I, I designed a, some book plates for this event. And what I wanted to do was let everyone know that anyone who wants one, no matter where you bought your copy, if you tuned in today or you're watching this later on and you would like a signed book plate, um, send a note to downtownbookandsound at gmail.com or, or a, uh, a message on Facebook or YouTube, either one with your mailing address, a private message. Don't, don't put it out in public with your, <laughs> with your address, your home address or something. Um, and we will mail uh, a signed book plate to you anywhere in the world, free of charge, um, even if you bought your book somewhere where we're not really, you know, too interested in you buying it from but um <laughs> you don't have to buy it from us at downtown book and sound so just so you know we'll 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 hook you up with a book plate if, no matter where you got your that's book. really kind of you trish thank you hey it's good it's some goodwill yeah <laughs> and whenever someone comes visits us in salinas um and what we're famous for here is being the hometown of john steinbeck he was born mm -hmm. here he was raised here when he till he was 18 um, went away to university at Stanford. Uh, this was his home, his house where he was born was is just a, about three blocks from where I'm sitting right now. That's great. And they just they I, I hear rumblings of an undiscovered novel about werewolves. 
Yes. So he actually wrote a, a novel, a complete novel that's been edited. He, he, he shopped it to some, um, uh, to several publishers during his lifetime. No one picked it up because it was a little too far out. I think, um, I think people thought that nobody would, would buy something about werewolves and Big Sur. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I ha I'm of the opinion that this would really be a great way to introduce a lot of young people to John yeah. Steinbeck because supernatural uh, uh, fiction is so popular right now. Oh, yeah. I yeah. I would, I, hopefully we get to see it. I would love a reissue. I would I would love for a new, a new Steinbeck novel. I never thought I would see that in my lifetime, you know? Oh, it, it's super exciting. And um, I, I was disappointed to hear that the, that the estate of John Steinbeck is not interested in publishing mm. it because they said, well, he never published it during his lifetime. But my understanding is he really wanted to. It was something that was mm. important to him. He thought it was a really cool idea, but you know, just nobody wanted to publish it at that time. Yeah. Well, we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you for the, for doing the, the, the reading of the letter that you wrote to, uh, to Jeff Bezos, the open letter. Um, I, I like that it, that it's on an up note, you know, let's go talk about this over pie and coffee at the, yeah. <laughs> the cafe across the street. Um, that, did did I read correctly that that the uh, that your cafe across the street closed during the pandemic? Yeah. Well, I was going to tell the story when we were talking about um, the the how much of a dollar stays in in when you support small businesses because this is a really inspiring story. So, uh, Lady Bird Diner is this. It's a really cute little retro um, diner. They specialize in pie, um, and they, they make everything kind of the old fashioned slow way. Um, and it's run by my friend Meg, and and she, um, they didn't even do carry out um, before the pandemic. Like their kitchen is so small, and they they prioritize the in cafe dining experience so much that you couldn't even order carry out. You had to eat there and, and get in line. So they were, I mean, they they couldn't make the pivot, and they weren't interested in working with apps like DoorDash or, or Uber Eats, and the, you know those places can be just as predatory as Amazon. Um, and so what Meg did was initially she just um, shut down and with whatever was left in the pantry, she made some some bag lunches and was like, these are free if anyone needs it. Um, and uh, the, the response was so overwhelming that she just converted Lady Bird Diner into a food pantry and, and distributed for uh, it started in March at the end of March 2020. And she just stopped two weeks ago. Um, 200 free lunches a day. And so she, she raised money, she got grants, she did crowdfunding, and they just really hustled and turned this little diner into a, a free pantry for, for whoever needed it, no questions asked. Um, and I, I was, you know, I'm inspired by this. This is amazing. This is small business doing community work. But one of the ways that Meg raised money is that she had long been thinking about writing a book and she's an amazing writer. So she got together with me to talk about it and she worked with the University Press of Kansas um, to, to edit and, and print it. Um, and so she has an essay collection called Lady Bird Collected. Um, after costs were recouped, you know, she made um, enough money with each book sold to provide four lunches. And that's like right now, that's the Raven's best selling book of all time is Lady Bird Collected. Um, so that, I mean, that's great. I mean, that's, of course, I love that. That's helping my friend do good work. But it's also every dollar every dollar every cent of every dollar spent on ladybird collected stayed in lawrence kansas because that book was written in lawrence kansas it was edited and printed and produced in lawrence kansas and the profits were used to feed people in need in lawrence kansas and like that's that's something that you're, you're never going to find with amazon and like when sometimes when you spend money on amazon like zero cents you could be leaving no money in your community um and um, whereas in an example like this of small businesses working together uh, to to help the community, I mean, from an economic and an, like just a ethical, emotional standpoint, that's an amazing story about Lawrence, Kansas, taking care of itself. Um, so, I mean, I wrote I wrote the letter and mentioned Lady Bird Diner before that all happened. But I, later in the book, I, I tell that story 
about Meg and, and her book um, because I think it's kind of the opposite of Amazon. <laughs> you know, it's it's forgetting the bottom line. It's just caring for your community first and, and figuring out the bottom line later. That is such a heartwarming story. I I, I read it in your book, of course, and and uh, and and was really um, kind of sad that that perhaps the the diner was closed for good. Now, is it some, is it something that might come back now that things are opening or? Yeah. Um, we're, uh, I think she's being really careful. Um, I haven't talked to her about it. It's like asking a small business owner, like, what are your plans? It's kind of like asking a senior in college, like, what are you doing after graduation? It's like, it's a hard decision. I don't want to bug you about it. I'm sure you'll figure it out. Um, but they are, they've been selling pie for a little while. You can go in there and get a slice of pie in the afternoons. Um, I think they have plans to do something. I'm really curious to see what it is. I'm sure it'll be amazing, um, but it's not it's not shuttered. Uh, there's not a for lease sign on the window at all. Um, they'll be back in some form. And I, I have to imagine that this kind of service um, and, and outreach will be part of their, a bigger part of their business model going forward. Well, I'm very glad to hear that. That's, uh, that's, that's, that's good. I I was thinking if I ever make it to uh to Lawrence, Kansas, I definitely want to go have a yeah. Pizza oh yeah, and uh, and come into the Raven Bookstore because it sounds like a fantastic place. We'd love to have you. <laughs> uh, I, I love visiting bookstores even before, of course. You know, I own yeah. but but now there's a special thing. I feel this great affinity towards other bookstore owners. Um, like we have the secret that, <laughs> that do you, uh, do you introduce yourself when you go into another bookstore or do you browse incognito? I absolutely introduce myself. Yeah. I mean, I might browse right. around for a few minutes incognito because, uh, you know, just like barging in like, Hey, I'm Trish from this other bookstore, you know? Um, but I, I, I definitely want to introduce myself because I, I, I'd like to get to know other bookstore owners. Yeah. I think it's a good, um, you know, with the, the, the other local bookstores around here in the Monterey Bay region, which Salinas, Salinas is part of a, uh, the, the Monterey Bay region of the central coast of California. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're very close to the ocean. We're about eight miles from the ocean as the crow flies. Um, so we, we have great access to beaches and stuff. But so we have this awesome area and there are other bookstores in the area, um, probably like six or seven other bookstores within a, a 40 minute drive. Um, and we all know each other and, and send customers each other's way, which is a great way to, uh, to help keep money local as well. So if mm -hmm. we don't have a book, I, we call around or email around to the other places and say, Hey, do you have such and such? And we'll send a customer their way, or they'll send a book to us a lot of times, you know, we'll be like, Hey, we'll, we'll share books. And that's a really good way to, to, uh, to keep it local. The rising tide raises all ships. It's yeah, it's the it's the least competitive really? industry I've ever been in. <laughs> like bookstores <laughs> really are all it's 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 so easy to forget that we're all technically competitors because we just I mean it's there's bookstores so so commonly root for other bookstores and and they're just generally interested in the success of all bookstores. Um which again is kind of an anti Amazon thing. It's like Amazon looks at an industry as like how can we how can we lower prices, force these people out of business, and then swoop in and take over their market and raise prices again? Um, it's th the opposite of monopoly thinking. It's how can all these little little tiny businesses work together to create something bigger uh, and try to push for good and the success of each other? Um, it's, I love it. Uh, you know, book industry conferences are so fun. It's so fun to go visit other bookstores. Um, it, there really is a tremendous amount of camaraderie among um, independent bookstores, even though they're technically business competitors. See, but I'm, I've I've been one of these crazy people throughout my my career, and I spent a lot of time in retail before I ever got to teaching. Um, I've believe I've always believed that there's no such thing as competition. I think that the more stores that carry similar or the same products. Uh, gives consumers more choice, and therefore it creates a demand for um, it creates more demand for these these what I'm going to call premium products, which I, books are what I would mm -hmm. consider a premium product. Um, and so we you the more demand, the more stores need to be around to fill the yeah. demand. So there's there's uh, to me 
if I had another independent bookstore open up across the street from me, I'd actually be happy about it. I'd, I'd be like, oh, this is awesome. We can we can support more, more book selling. And I don't think of it as a competition. But unfortunately, I think a lot of retail places do. And mm-hmm. I think they're in some ways shooting themselves in the foot because it, we're, we really are all in this together. We are a yeah. community and we should be supporting each other in the community. That is my, my opinion. Yeah, well, no, I think uh, I'm not interested in, in having a successful business as much as I am interested in having a successful community. And, and so um, like Lady Bird Diner being successful means I can be successful, which means Free State Brewing Company around the corner can be successful. And it's like if downtown Lawrence or Lawrence in general or Eastern Kansas or the Midwest uh, is a thriving and interesting community that supports its artists and its writers and its readers, um, that's good news for everybody, not just for my bottom line, but just for the, the happiness of living in a place like this. It, it makes uh, the entire Kansas Lawrence Midwestern experience richer. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's, it's I mean, having a profitable business helps uh, pay my employees fairly and, and it, it helps me take care of what I need to. But my, my bigger goal is, is building community for sure. That's fantastic. And I, I agree with you there too. It's, it, it really is about building the community. I've been involved in our downtown here for, for many, many years before I ever opened up a store. And so I, I'm, I, I see that the arts and culture um, that I've helped bring to our downtown has, uh, you know, one of many people, I'm not the only one, obviously, but um, has helped build community and build demand for the arts and literature and, mm-hmm. and all that. The, all that good stuff that's uh that it's just it's it's pretty special i'm happy to be i can't wait to come to come and see your store in kansas as soon as i as, as soon as we're able to take a road trip i'm i'm there great it'll be a new one we're 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 renovating a new location as we speak so we've got a couple of months left in our original spot um but we're we're going from a thousand feet to 2500 square feet um, brand new build out. Uh, it was a location that had a fire. It was an axe throwing place that had a fire. And so it was down to the bones and we've, we've rebuilt it from scratch, uh, to be a, a gorgeous new bookstore, um, a very slow and painstaking process that's been delayed many times, but I really do think we're nearing the finish line. Uh, we, we unloaded the bo- their bookshelves in there. They're not put together or mounted, but we're, we're really getting close. And so this like reopening today was is really, this is the chance for everyone to come say goodbye uh, to 34 years of Raven in that location before we, we open this new one. It's, it's really exciting times here. And hopefully by the time you make it, the, the new space will be ready because it's going to be pretty spectacular. How far away is it from your current location? Just t- uh, a block and a half down the street. And so we're we're um, a half a block off of our main street and we're moving kind of onto the main drag in the heart of it and do a really good retail block. I've got um, a couple of my very good friends run businesses on the same block, um, surrounded by good restaurants. So uh, it'll we'll be in the thick of it. We're kind of, uh, we're a little hidden now, but we will be hidden no more in the new spot. That is so exciting. Congratulations. So your your store will be about the size of my store then. Mm -hmm. We're we're about 2,500 square feet. Is it a good size? Do you like it? I estimated that we have probably over 60,000 books in Mm -hmm. our store with a kind of a count. That's, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, it's one of the things that's a little uh, scary to me is like the, the space will be good, but there's gonna be a lot of empty shelves unless I buy a lot more books and, uh, you know, we're, we're new only. So, so buying books is a, an expensive process, but, um, I'm sure we'll be all right. We'll figure it out. Have you thought about carrying used books also? Well, all? that's, that's part of it is there are three bookstores in downtown Lawrence. One, we sell new books. There's a Christian bookstore and there's a used bookstore. Um, and, uh, we support each other and it's like, if someone needs a Bible, I send them there. If someone needs a used book or they don't, they can't pay new prices, I send them there. And then if any of them need a a new book, they send. so it's like, we all kind of support each other. And I would hate to, to undermine this balance, um, we have. Um, so I use books is interesting and I think it's, it makes, it's a decision that makes business sense for a lot of ways, but I think the passion of the team we have right now is in new books and they like to do the, 
the indie next and, and read the advanced copies and, and be plugged into what's happening right now. Uh, so they have a lot of fun with new books and the author events. And uh, so, um, and, and the used bookstore in town does a pretty good job. And I kind of, you know, it's that, that community versus competition thing. That makes that makes complete sense, and I I didn't realize that you had three three bookstores in your downtown. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. We are gonna do. We're gonna really lean into kids. Uh, I I think we can do much better with our kids. And this is part me having a three year old and just and like falling in love with children's literature uh, alongside him. Um, but uh, the the new space is set up for story times. We have a little stage in there. Uh, the children's section is much bigger. It's gonna be very brightly colored. Uh, and so we're in bigger, the children's section is much, much bigger. And so we're really looking um, to, to, to beef up and energize our, our kids um, area, um, which should be a lot of fun. So that, that said, what's your favorite kids book currently? I'm, you know, I was, uh, it was the Eric Carl passing away really hit me hard because I was just falling in love with those books and, um, I like the, the very hungry caterpillar is just a stone cold classic. I get choked up every time I read it still. Uh, <laughs> what a beautiful story of, of not only transformation, but also just the joy of pigging out. Uh, so, and, and his illustrations are gorgeous. Uh, nobody does illustrations. Um, and they're also so funny, uh, and welcoming and just from a design standpoint, they're gorgeous. Uh, so we have like one of our big reopening displays was just all of the Eric Carl books I could get that were in stock, um, just 20 or 30. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then it's also really fun because he's he's not reading yet. He's just three, but he's he can he memorizes. And so like he can get through brown bear, brown bear. What do you see? Because like he knows the order of the animals. And so he can read it. I know he's not seeing the words, but he can read it to me, uh, which is pretty fun. That is so sweet. I love that. It, it's like he's so he's so proud of himself too, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you my very favorite ch children's book was a book that I read as a little kid. And I spent hours and hours looking at this one picture in it. And that's Go Dog Go mm -hmm. by, uh, by Eastman. And, uh, and the picture in the back with the dogs on the top of the tree doing all these crazy stuff. I, I just was fascinated by, I want to be in that dog party. Basically. <laughs> like, who wouldn't want to be up in a tree playing yeah. with dogs, right? <laughs> did, so did that have something to do with you becoming an artist, you think? Was I that think one so. page? Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's great. Yeah, absolutely, it did. did. And um, I, uh, I really, you know, I really went to school to be an artist. I thought that that was what my my career would be and here I am teaching and, and owning a bookstore. So you know, it's amazing what life brings you. Yeah. Well, it's good synergy. If you ever need book plates, you can keep take care of it in house. <laughs> I can exactly. Well, you know, it's interesting because I, I was able to get Sarah Penner from um, the lost apothecary who the, a, mm -hmm. a book that just came out fairly recently um, to do an event with us. And I was so excited because here's like a, a, you know, a real author, you know, not, not just a local, when I say just a local person, that sounds like bad, but it, it's not bad. We have a lot of really, really talented mm -hmm. authors here um, and they're part of our community. And of course, that's one of my my big um, commitments uh, besides being green is to support local authors and, and develop those relationships. But I was kind of really excited to have, yeah. um, to have her because I read her book and I really loved it. Uh, an, an advanced reading copy, which which is one of the perks of owning a bookstore, right? It's like you get yeah. to have oh, it. Yeah. Advance. It's so exciting. Um, and uh, and so I actually painted a watercolor picture that was inspired by her book. And then that was, we used that for the book book plate. And uh, so I'm it's sure a, she loved that. Well, I was like, I was still nice. You know, you may think I'm a little weird, but I actually <laughs> did fan art. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, that's great. It's good. Um, so I wanted to ask you uh, if you would uh, if you would mind sharing a poem of yours with us. Oh, sure. Or we before. I mean, I think we have about five minutes left. Okay. Um, I haven't really had any comments from the audience, um, and and maybe we will, and maybe we won't. But uh, we'll uh, if we do, we'll we'll take them at the end. Okay. Let's see here. 
Okay, here's a here's a parent. This is a parenting poem. Uh, Flavor Town. Um, it's uh, it's a mix of poems. Um, half the poems in Flavor Town are uh, imagining Flavor Town as a real place, and and Guy. It's Flavor Town is one of Guy Fieri's catchphrases, and he says all these things about Flavor Town. And so I wrote a series of speculative poems about Flavor Town, what it's actually like there. Uh, but then it's juxtaposed with a series of poems about the actual Midwest. Um, and, uh, and, and how people actually live uh, here and, and, and form families and relationships. And, and part of that for me was, was becoming a father. And so this is one of the latter. Um, this is a poem about becoming a father in the actual Midwest. It's called The American Kid West. Grass swaddles the plains like a swaddle. Our national anthem is something off a children's album from the library that puts babies to sleep instantly, but only at extreme volume. We eat at chain restaurants because they have parking and car seat slings and enough room to put them next to the table. When our children begin eating solid foods, there will be something on those menus for them to eat, perhaps an illustrated cup to take home. Our currency is snacks stuffed into diaper bags alongside accessories and ephemera changing pads, thermometers, extra keys, outfits, that gift certificate we lost months ago. We strap mirrors to headrests. We are known for our competence and our freezers and our tired faces. Our grocery stores are giant and have parking spaces for expectant and new mothers. The carts warn us not to mount our car seats onto the handles, but we do anyway. We know balance and we'd catch our children if they ever fell. They don't. That's the American Kid West from Flavor Town. Out now from Harpoon Books out of Columbus, Ohio. Soon to be available at Downtown Book and Sound. Absolutely. We're going to bring that in because I, I, I enjoyed that. Thank you so much for thank sharing you. with us. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I just really want to thank you again for, for, for joining us and, and for writing this book. Let me see if I can get it to go so that, oh, let me, um, let me get back into the screen here so everyone can see. There we go. Um, and so you can you can get, yeah, and you have your copy too. There we go. How yeah. to Resist Amazon and Why. And uh, definitely you want to pick up a copy somewhere at an independent bookstore, okay, no matter where you're tuning in from. Uh, go go independent and get your copy and uh, and build community in your community, right? That, that's we want everyone to do. <laughs> build more community. So, Danny, um, do you have anything that you'd like to to share with us before we before we go tonight? Just uh, shop small, take care of your communities. If you can't imagine your community without a certain restaurant or a small business, make sure now is the time. Uh, to support them and build relationships with them um, and and help uh, shepherd them out of this very difficult time into a thriving future. Well said. Thank you, Danny. And we we really appreciate you being with us tonight. Thanks for having uh, me. This is fun. Forward, I, look, I look forward to meeting you in person in the future. And uh, yep. if you ever make it out to sunny California, make sure you come and visit us, okay? Okay, will do. Definitely Thanks, Trish. Buy you coffee and a slice of pie. Okay, <laughs> great. It's a deal. <laughs> okay, have a good night. And anyone, by the way, who who wants a book plate, please do send us a an email or a private message with your mailing address, and uh, Danny will will I we will send you a signed book plate by Danny Kane to go with your copy of How to Resist Amazon and Why. Right. Have a good night, everyone. We're going to sign off now and uh, shop small. <laughs>